Hey there, college football fans, and welcome Notre Dame fans or fans of Notre Dame opponents who want to do a little cautious scouting of the Fighting Irish in 2022. We are very glad to be joined by Tim Priester of Irish Illustrated. Tim's part of a trio of knowledgeable Irish guys on the Irish Illustrated podcast, as well as the senior editor of Irish Illustrated Online, part of the 24-7 Sports Network. Tim, cheers to you and many thanks for taking the time to join us today. Thank you, Tim. My pleasure. All right. So, Fans, Tim does a great job, as we like to think we do as well, bringing you, the fans, great content. And we encourage you to follow us on Twitter, at ChappieCFB and at CFFMWaxman, and follow him at Tim Priester. That's P-R-I-S-T-E-R for those who need the spelling. But please also be sure to check out our website, CFPCollegeFootball.com, where we will post our rundown of the Irish in 2022 with depth chart, stats, schedules and projections and a whole lot more and obviously keep subscribed to our podcast and youtube channel for continued coverage of all things college football especially the irish now tim i grew up with an appreciation of notre dame football and of course their games on cbs and then or nbc eventually was a big help since they weren't a premium cable station that at the time my family couldn't afford so i was able to watch the irish for free minus the cost of electricity but one of my first favorite college football players was rick meyer and one of my favorite plays was the uh, famous two-point conversion pass to Reggie Brooks in the back of the end zone against Penn State in the Snow Bowl in 1992. So tell us, Tim, about what you do and how you became to be affiliated with Notre Dame football. Well, I was born and raised in South Bend. I met Eric Parsegian when I was eight years old. I went to my first Notre Dame game in 1966 when I was six. Uh, and they, of course, went on to win a national title that year. So Uh, I've been indoctrinated in it since birth, pretty much, and uh, it was a goal of mine to attend the University of Notre Dame and play baseball for them. I achieved those goals, and right after graduation in 82, I got a phone call asking me if I would like to write about uh, Notre Dame football, and um, having done that for, um, having done work for the South Bend Tribune, I I jumped at the opportunity to do that with uh, at the time, uh, it was called Go Irish. It became Blue and Gold Illustrated. And then myself and a couple other guys branched off into irishillustrated.com in the mid-2000s. So um, born and raised in it, and uh, looks like I'm going to die in it too as well. Very good, very good. And, um, you know, my one of my brothers is a huge Notre Dame fan, and he's actually the one that kind of got me into listening to your podcast and following you. And, um, you know, he's... He's my pulse for all things Notre Dame, but, it, you know, it's, it's a great pleasure to have you here with us. So what we're going to kind of do here is obviously we're going to talk 2022 prospects for the Irish. We're going to start with our projections. Uh, I'm going to go. Wax is going to go. And we're curious of your thoughts after the two of us run it down. So as I look at the schedule, and we'll talk more about schedule in a minute, but I see Notre Dame going nine and three, six and two against power five opponents. Not too shabby. Uh, I see the losses at Ohio State, at home against Clemson and at USC. But I have, you know, question marks next to the Clemson and USC games, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. And I also caution Irish fans to be a little careful of BYU. It's a good BYU team that they're going to play in Vegas. So, Wax, how do you see the Irish faring in 2022? Um, I can see either 9-3 and three or 10-2. and two. Um, One of the games you mentioned, the um, – the, the Clemson game, to me, is a toss-up. I'm not as high on Clemson this year as a lot of people are. Um, so I could see that one going either way. But 9-3, and 10-2 and two area is, is where I see Notre Dame this year. All right, Tim, so how close are we? Were we yeah. kind of on base, or um, do you see things uh, even better than we project? No, I'm right around there. I, I think, you know, for Marcus Freeman in his first full season to go to his alma mater, uh, Ohio Stadium. I've been there for a Notre Dame game. It's been a while, uh, but I've been there and I know what that environment's going to be like. So that's going to be really difficult. It's hard to project a win in the opener at Ohio State. And you know, I, you know, Mike, I, I, I'm on the Clemson bandwagon this year. I, I think that they're going. We're going to see a better version of them um, defensively. I just finished. We do a. We do a series of stories during the summer called First Rate, where we rate each position and then schedule and coaching and things like that. And this Clemson defense, which was number seven in the country last year, it's going to be outstanding. Their defensive line is still in that range of, you know, like the 2018 group. I'm not sure it'll be that good, 
uh, because they had three first round draft choices on that defensive line. But I think it's going to be a really good Clemson team. I think their quarterback play will be uh, more consistent and improved from last year. And then when you look at USC's roster, the, the additions that Lincoln Riley has made, particularly in the skill positions, this is going to be a completely different USC team than we've seen in recent years. And if they can get some things straight now defensively, Lincoln Riley brought his defensive coordinator over from, from Oklahoma where they made improvements under him. Um, you know, I think they're going to be formidable. So, uh, you know, those three opponents will be very difficult. BYU absolutely in Vegas. BYU's won 21 games in the last two years. I think, I think Boston College could conceivably be challenging. Uh, at home, Phil Jerkovic coming back to Notre Dame will be a, a, an interesting uh, side story there. So this schedule is a little bit more difficult, I think, just on paper as we look at it than some of the ones that we've seen in, in, in recent years. So I think a 10-2 and two season would be a heck of an accomplishment for, for Marcus Freeman in his first year. Not that he didn't inherit a bunch of talent. I mean, he owes a lot of thanks to Brian Kelly for – for uh, being handed a, a, a 54 win program over the last five years, but he has to learn how to be a game day coach. And as we saw in a Fiesta Bowl against Oklahoma state, uh, there's some things to learn along the way. Yeah. So talking about schedule, Tim, um, what do you consider Notre Dame's second toughest game after Ohio state? Who's going to come in ranked number two. I just saw the most recent uh, Vegas line is 14 and a half point favorites. The Buckeyes are, I honestly think Notre Dame should keep it closer to that. And um, if they can keep it under 10, that's going to say a lot about the, the Irish prospects this season. But um, getting back to the question, who is the second toughest game after Ohio State? Is it a Clemson team that at home in Notre Dame Stadium that's looking to redeem themselves from last year's down season? Um, not to mention losing the last time they went to South Bend in 2020. Or is it an unknown, potentially reloaded USC with a new coach and a new sense of hope that could play spoiler to Notre Dame in the last game of the year? Yeah, I think it's real close, certainly playing Clemson at home again as a benefit to Notre Dame. But, I, you know, I'm going to pick Clemson uh, as the, the second most difficult just because their defense, I think, is going to be really, really good this year. I, and as I said, I do think Louis Angelelli is going to, to play better at quarterback and they'll get some things straightened out there. So, you know, all three of them are difficult. Uh, the only thing that matters is who the, who the opponent is that week. And when Clemson comes up, you know, if Notre Dame's in a one-loss situation, that's that's going to be really tough. Um, I, you know, I, to see Clemson lose three games last year and struggle at times the way they did, that's an aberration. I think they bounce back this year, and they're more of the Clemson version that we've seen in recent years. Yeah, and I talked about it on a recent uh, uh, segment that I do called Walk It Off with Chappie, where all three of Clemson's losses were by a combined 23 points, and Michigan, who made it in the CFP uh, playoff, lost to Georgia by 23 points just in that one game. And that's a Clemson team that only dropped that uh, opener by seven. So I'm with you. I think Clemson is kind of reloaded for this year and, and they'll be you know loaded for bear. So let's move on then to, you know, kind of some of the personnel and, and the unit talks and, and Wax, do you want to um, throw out a question you have for Tim regarding offense, defense, or, you know, player personnel? First off, I wanted uh, Tim to re remember when Ohio State played Notre Dame in the 90s, we had a brief phone conversation uh, when I worked for Buckeye Sports Bulletin. We did like a, an opponent preview. So um, so I've actually spoken with Tim, but it was it was a lifetime ago. So I wasn't sure he remembered that. I know he comes in contact with so many people, but uh, I definitely like you have been following Tim for a long time. Um, as far as offense and defense, it seems like the really um, in I don't want to say intriguing, I guess important part for Notre Dame, what are they going to do at running back? There have been so many injuries, such a depleted core. I mean, Chris Tyree obviously is the guy, but behind him, I mean, is it, is it, um, is, is it Logan behind him or is that just kind of by default or, or it just doesn't seem like they have a lot of bodies. And with a new quarterback coming in, you would love to have a great running game. Well, a couple months ago, or I should say like the morning of the blue gold game on April 23rd, I believe it was, we looked at this running back group and saw Jadarian Price, an early entry freshman who really, really impressed him in the spring. And of course, Logan Diggs and, and uh, Chris Tyree, Audric Estime is a guy that they, they really like. And then they added Javron Payne to the freshman class uh, late in the process. So there were five guys there that you felt great about. 
But Diggs suffered a, a, a shoulder injury in the second half of the blue gold game, and he won't be ready for the start of the season. He won't be ready. He, there's the possibility he could be ready for Ohio State, but that's that's very unlikely. Uh, and then, of course, Jadarian Price suffered a, uh, an Achilles injury during summer conditioning. So they're down to three. I, you know, I think it's really, really important that Chris Tyree takes his game to another level. He's a guy that, with great speed, he had that 96-yard kickoff return against Wisconsin and Chicago. But he has to prove that he can break some tackles, and he hasn't done that yet. He's a smaller back. And so that's the challenge with him. And then, you know, Audric Estime really moves up from – what I think we would have projected as number four running back going into the season and number two and Jabron Payne, who was verbally committed to Indiana, who looked like he may be a red shirt candidate is probably going to have to play uh, from the outset. So price is out for the year and Diggs is probably out through at least September. Uh, so sometime in October. So that's a bit of a, that, uh, it's a concern. There's no doubt because that looked like a strength for them. Uh, especially when you add the issues that they have at wide receiver, their skill positions on offense are a little bit compromised right now. The good thing is the offensive line, which, which gelled and came together in the second half of last season comes back basically intact. They lose Kane Madden, but um, you know, they, they uh, they're going to do some shifting there and you're going to get Joe Alt and Blake Fisher at the two tackle spots. And those, those two positions are in really, really good hands if they can stay healthy for a couple of years and then, you know, the real strength of Notre Dame football 2022, at least as we look at it now heading into the season, is the defensive line. So give me a great offensive line and a, and a great defensive line. You have a chance to win a whole lot of football games. Tim and I agree with that. We've always said when we're looking at teams, we definitely look to see if they have a returning quarterback, but what do they have in the trenches and what do they have up front on defense? So you're definitely in good shape there. Um, I love Isaiah Foskey. I have him as a first team All-American. Um, Adam Malola, Jason is a good player. Getting Brandon Joseph in the uh, transfer portal is great. It's, it's a very good secondary and the linebacking core is deep. What do you think will be... Um, I guess best case scenario for for this defense are, are they a, a team that can give up maybe keep it down to around 20 20 points a game or thereabouts is that kind of what the goal is well i think it'll be better than that really because i mean the last four years they've been in the top 15 and scoring defense now you bring in l golden who's a very experienced defense of mine he spent the last five years with the bengals he was in the super bowl came directly from the super bowl to notre dame so he hasn't had much of a break, but uh, yeah, I think the defense has a chance to, to, to be really great. It started with Mike Elko uh, who brought in his defensive philosophy and his linebacker coach who was Clark Lee. Clark Lee took over for Elko when he left for Texas A&M. And then now, um, you know, then you had, uh, of course, Marcus Freeman with his one year and they were again, a top 15 defense. So I, you know, this defense looks really good. I think the linebacker core looks better than last year, especially if you can, uh, if you get a healthy Maris Leofau in the, in the lineup, he had that uh, unfortunate injury in late August last year. We never had an opportunity to see him. And I think the secondary has a chance to be much improved. You mentioned Brandon Joseph. He is an All-American level safety. There's no doubt about that. He's not Kyle Hamilton, but he's a really, really good football player. And then I think guys like Cam Hart take a significant step up at corner. They need Clarence Lewis to do that as well. They were thrilled with Tariq Bracey at nickel in the spring. And they had an early entry freshman. That the, the compliment to Jadarian Price on offense among early entry freshmen in the spring was Jaden Mickey at cornerback uh, in the spring. He's going to play a lot. And I think this defense is going to be really, really good once again. And uh, I, chiming in before we get to our next segment here, Tim, um, J.D. Bertrand is, in my opinion, the most underrated linebacker in America. And, you know, he burst out of the scene last year, was a tackling machine. And then we saw the good things that his brother, John Michael Bertrand did for the Notre Dame baseball team on the diamond. And so now JD has a chance to kind of sandwich um, those good seasons with, uh, you know, I'm hoping an all American type year at linebacker there for the Irish. So as we, you know, you talked about Marcus Freeman and uh, you know, we've done a pretty good job about not talking about Brian Kelly, but um you know, you've said many times um, 
that despite his record in playoff games and New Year's Six Bowl games, Brian Kelly coached his teams to win the games they were expected to win. That'll be something that Marcus Freeman needs to learn to do as a new coach. So outside of the, uh, the three of Ohio State, Clemson, and USC, what do you see as the opponent that could give Notre Dame some trouble? Um, and actually, you know, uh, extending when we talk about coaches, what's something that you see that Marcus Freeman could do better that Brian Kelly, um, not to say that Brian Kelly didn't do it well, but maybe something that Freeman could take and make even better now that he's there as the head guy. Yeah. First of all, I, I would list BYU as the fourth toughest uh, opponent. I, you know, I think Brian Kelly is, I, you know, I know a lot of Notre Dame fans were disappointed in the big game losses. He did have some big game wins too, but when it got to postseason, they were often overmatched. And we talk about, you know, offensive line, defensive line strength, uh, that being the strength of Notre Dame, the differentiator from the Ohio States and the Alabamas and the Clemsons, generally speaking, is that skill position talent. And that's where Marcus Freeman has a chance to really differentiate himself. Now he needs to learn how to coach, you know, games as a head coach. He's a quality football coach, but he has to learn how to be uh, a head coach. Brian Kelly won all the games that he should. And people would say, all he, you know, he, he only wins the games that he should. Well, that's how you put yourself in a playoff situation, a playoff position. So we have to see whether Marcus Freeman can do that on a weekly basis. You know, where is the psyche of your team on a weekly basis? We saw Brian Kelly fall short at times, 2019 against Michigan, you know, Clemson and the ACC championship. Those were, I never did quite understand the Michigan loss because they were just, they seemed mentally and emotionally unprepared to play that game that night. It was a miserable night in, in Ann Arbor. But, uh, you know, recruiting wise, that's where Marcus Freeman is going to make the biggest difference. We've seen it this past week. They had five verbal commitments in the six day span, which is pretty incredible. You know, they orchestrate that now. Somebody asked me, did, did uh, Lou Holtz ever have a week like that in recruiting? Well, probably not because they didn't orchestrate it where he had, hey, this guy's going to commit on the third. Do you want to commit on the fourth? OK, right. Do you want to commit on the sixth or whatever day it was? Uh, but. Now, that's the differentiator right now. I, recruiting is at the forefront of everything that Marcus Freeman does from, you know, January until you get into preseason practice in August. And recruiting is always a big part of our website. That's what people pay for, quite frankly. Right. Uh, but it is absolutely at the forefront of Irish Illustrated on a daily basis because of what a great recruiter Marcus Freeman and his staff, what those guys have done. All right, uh, got time for maybe another question here for you, uh, Tim. And uh, go ahead, Wax. Uh, Tim, with, with the, the big news, obviously, in the last couple of weeks is conference realignment. The Big Ten is getting bigger. Um, Oklahoma and Texas are going to be going to the Big 12, and the Big 12 has reached out to other teams. Is Does Notre Dame at some point have to get into a conference, or are they prepared to just say, you know what, we've been independent, we're going to stay independent and kind of do things our way. I think short term, and I'm not really sure how short short term is, um, but short term for um, for this season, I'm not sure that Notre Dame has to make a decision. But I think it's pretty inevitable that we're heading down a path here where at some point it's just not feasible anymore. It's not sustainable. And I think that if we get to the a conglomerate of two or three conferences where the FBS basically separates itself from the other from the group of five FBS schools. If it gets to that point and we're, we're going that, that direction, whether it's big 10 sec and ACC or just big 10 sec with those conferences absorbing the ACC and the PAC 12 and the big 12 there. And then what I've been saying is there's so many layers to this now that we can't even, there are things we can't even speculate about yet because there's so many layers to it. But I think eventually Notre Dame has to go in that direction because that's the direction that college football is going. Um, they still will have a path to the national championship short term. Um, you know, they, they still can recruit. They can do all the things that they want to do. They can schedule and do all those things. But where they, were, where they will fall short long-term financially is if they stay independent. You have to reap the benefits of the contracts. 
I don't think Notre Dame will be in the SEC. I don't think that that's a good match, but I think Big Ten ultimately would be where Notre Dame would go unless there's some way that the ACC can get involved in this, but I don't think it's going in that direction financially in order for Notre Dame to keep pace with these, uh, with these other schools. You can't keep, especially after a pandemic, you can't keep leaving 20, 25, $30 million on the table to stay independent. And I think that's ultimately is what is happening um, with this conglomeration, these large uh, conferences that are starting to be built. Well, Tim, I don't know about Wax. I, I think I can speak for him, but uh, I got even more than the grade I was expecting from you and your thoughts about the Notre Dame Fighting Irish. And one of the best things about the Irish Illustrated podcast is that you three are very articulate, you expand on your ideas, and you cover a variety of angles and perspectives. So did you want to take a minute to tell the listeners where they can find you and maybe how they can communicate and contribute constructively, that is, yeah. as they wish? Thank you, Tim. I appreciate that. We take, I've always taken a lot of pride in, in not being a homer. Now, inside, in my heart, I, I am absolutely a homer for Notre Dame. I want them to win all the time. But we have jobs as journalists, and I've always taken that very seriously. And from an early age, I wanted to be a sports journalist and got lucky enough to do Notre Dame uh, for a career, for a lifetime. Um, but we're going to tell it the, the way it is with a Notre Dame slant. There's no doubt. I mean, you're, you're going to listen to our podcast and say, um, you know, they're for Notre Dame or at least Priester and O'Malley are for Notre Dame. Uh, Pete Sampson from The Athletic doesn't uh, necessarily have the, the the Notre Dame lore background that we do, but we take pride in that. And so if you're looking for a Homer podcast or a completely Homer podcast, we're not it. If you're looking for an objective opinion about Notre Dame against their opponents, uh, that's us. And it's irishillustrated.com. Uh, we'd appreciate if you would uh, um, try our website and see if you like that. If not, you can... Uh, you can tune into our podcast and that is uh, that's called Irish Illustrated Insider. Yeah. And we'll Wax and I know we'll uh, put that out there and we'll, we'll retweet and make sure that anybody who wants a pulse on the Irish, um, they check out Irish Illustrated both online and in podcast form. So thanks again, Tim. And thanks to you, the fans. One of the great things about podcasts and social media is the positive and entertaining interaction and discourse that we can all have together about the sport and the teams we love to follow maybe even love to hate a little bit. And guys like Wax and Tim and myself love what we do in large part to people like you. So please continue to listen, subscribe, rate, and review, and pass along the good word about the cast and the site, cfpcollegefootball.com, and let others share in the simple but pertinent pleasures you do. This has been the CFP Podcast. For Wax and our guest, Tim Priester, I'm Chappie. See you soon, friends.